Leaders. Real life leaders. Hey guys, I'm so excited to introduce to you Tim Francis. He is an award-winning entrepreneur from Canada. He has now moved to Austin, Texas, and he is the founder of greatassistant.com. And he has hired over 300 assistants in the United States. And we are so excited to have him. Tim, tell us first a little bit about yourself. Well, I I started, uh, like most entrepreneurs, very humbly and uh, was living in my basement of, of my house. I had three roommates just to help pay the rent. And you know, Chantal, I was so happy. I was, even those very humble beginnings and um, n- nothing that would like really impress anyone if they saw it. I was free because I had, I had my time and I was a full-time entrepreneur. I could do anything I wanted. Um, around that time, I was investing in real estate and I had acquired four houses using pretty much none of my own money, which was really exciting. I felt very proud of that. Um, I was also a touring drummer at the time. Uh, my band had played 150 shows. We had three sponsors. We played at the Western Canadian Music Awards, which is really exciting. And I'd won a 30 under 30 award for my, for my city up in Canada. Um, then there was a, a series of events that lasted about you know, over the course of 18 months that really, really took me to my knees. So first of all, uh, the real estate market crashed back in 2008, 9, 10. It happened a little bit later in Canada than the US. And I lost over $100,000 of mostly other people's money. Um, my band broke up 20 minutes before going on stage at the Western Canadian Music Awards. And a mentor that I had ended up being one of the two leaders of a $12 million Ponzi scheme. Uh, his business partner was convicted and uh, barred from holding securities for 25 years and a quarter million dollar fine and ended up actually f- fleeing the country. <laughs> so it was an extremely stressful time. And it was also a very exhausting time, just given the fact that I was working 80 to 100 hour work weeks. So stress plus exhaustion, you put them together, it's a, a bad mix, very dangerous. And I ended up developing an illness called erythema nodosum, And I couldn't walk for three full months. Oh my I had, gosh. Yeah. I had to move back for full-time care with my parents. Had my mom not paid my mortgage for me for three months, I would have gone double bankrupt, both personally and in my business. And day after day, I would lay in bed staring at the ceiling because the swelling went from my ankles to my knees, to my hips, to my elbows. Like, like I couldn't even type. So I was like really immobile. And I just kept asking, like, what have I done to create the situation? Just really aiming to take personal responsibility for what my role was. And I, I had a few amazing breakthroughs, um, one of which came when I, I felt this warmth in my body and I heard a voice. And it's just like kind of tingles just ran through my whole body. And the voice said, Tim, is this what you want? And in that moment, time stood still. I don't know if a second went by or a minute or an hour. And I heard a second voice. It was a very weak and distant voice. It was my own voice. And I said, yes, this is what I want. And the second that I said that, all these, it was like dominoes started falling in my head, my heart, my spirit. And I realized that I'd been chasing fame and fortune when what I needed to be chasing was mastery. And so I made a promise to myself that if all I did for the rest of my life was get a little bit better at entrepreneurship with every single week that went by, even if I never became wealthy, even if I never became famous, even if it was a very humble life, that I would be very satisfied with that life. And so one thing led to another. And I started making a few dollars. Um, I then ran into a new issue though. And that new problem was that I was running out of time. And I, around that time I ran it, I saw a quote. It said, hell is meeting the man I could have been. Hell is meeting the man I could have been. And that just like, that took my breath away. And in that moment, I realized that if I was ever going to fulfill my potential in my lifetime, that I'd have to get help that life is a team sport and business is a team sport. Now, the problem was that I had read the four-hour work week in 2008, and I thought all I had to do was just get an overseas VA for a few dollars an hour and everything would be solved. And my first ever assistant that I got from India was a total train wreck. Like, she was actually amazing. She was incredibly talented, great English, you know, university educated. She was like everything you could ask for until one day when she just disappeared. For seven straight days, I had no idea where she went. I had no way of getting in touch with her because she's halfway around the world. It's not like I could like... At call anyone to like knock on her door. And so, uh, so after seven days, suddenly I got this flurry of Skype messages and email messages saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So what had happened was there was a political dispute 
And the representative of her neighborhood got into a fight with the representative, like the politician of another neighborhood. And that other neighborhood's politician actually controlled the electricity and had it turned off to her neighborhood. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, my business and my everyday is dependent on this assistant who's amazing. She, however, is dependent on third world infrastructure, corruption, and everything else that just kind of comes with the territory. So unfortunately, I did have to end that relationship, that, that working relationship. Um, and after that, I started hiring all over the world. Just, you know, if, if, if India didn't work, maybe the Philippines, if not the Philippines and Jamaica, then what about Pakistan? And I went all over the place. And, and again and again and again, I just kept failing over and over and over. Everything changed when I finally bit the bullet and hired my first ever North American assistant. It was way more than $4 an hour. Thankfully, though, it was still very affordable. This is uh, about seven or eight years ago. Um, it was $15 an hour. And to me, that seemed like, I mean, I made $37,000 the year before I got my assistant. So to pay someone $15 an hour seemed like a colossal investment. It was at the time. Um, I just knew that if I was going to fulfill my potential, I needed someone I could count on. And that trumped everything. So despite the fact that I didn't know what to delegate, I didn't know how I would afford it. And I was also a control freak and didn't know how to like let go of control. I still bit the bullet because it was too important to me that I fulfill my potential in my lifetime. So I hired, I hired Sarah. And within the 12 months after working with Sarah, like 12 months before it was $39,000, 12 months after it was $107,000. And my business didn't change. Same product, same service, same everything. The only difference is that I was free to focus on the big things in my business. And since then, I've had a lot of other entrepreneurs ask me for help on how to get their own great assistant. We've now helped over 300 assistants get placed with entrepreneurs around the United States and, and Canada. They're very affordable in the $18 to $22 an hour range. So it's way more affordable than people think. And we've helped people as big as $50 million companies to get assistance and as small as solopreneurs. Wow. Well, I am really surprised. I meet entrepreneurs all the time and CEOs. And I feel like they'll tell me, you know, I'm frustrated by low level administrative tasks. I feel like I'm just perpetually behind. I'm, you know, never caught up. I'm just doing tons of this low level work. And I'm thinking to myself, well, why don't you get an assistant? So what are some of the reasons why people just are not getting an assistant? I had the exact same question because it seems like it's something that most entrepreneurs who are making a few dollars should be doing. and. Um, so we interviewed 149 entrepreneurs in the fall of 2015. And we said, what is your number one biggest frustration or challenge in getting a great assistant? Um, do you have any guesses? Yeah, I mean, I can just tell you, or if you I want to play along. Just one that I would say is that yeah. what I've heard people say is that I had an assistant. They were more work than they you know, were worth. <laughs> you know, like it was, I had to spend more time training them on what to do. It would take me, you know, 45 minutes to have them do it when right. for me, I could have done it in five minutes. I'm already overwhelmed. I already have too much to do. So that was mm -hmm. important for us. Instead of me saving stress by having that assistant, it would add stress and I just don't have time to train them. I would say that would be the biggest one. And the second one would just be like, you know, especially ebbs and flows where they felt like you know, I really need an assistant. I have a lot to give them. And then there might be times where I don't know what to give them. So I hate to be paying someone, which, you know, I don't know what I should delegate to them would be probably right. the things I hear. So, so I think you've used, so hundred percent, that's exactly, that's exactly what we found. The, the words that we heard was um, from, from least common to most common, least common was like, I don't know where to find them. I don't want to take the time to train them. I don't want to take the time to manage them and fix their mistakes. Um, I don't know to pay them, right? And the, the biggest one of all was, actually, I don't know how to let go of control and I don't know how to trust. That was the number one challenge of frustration entrepreneurs had. So, so I think what's really interesting, what I noticed was because I'd read the 4-Hour Workweek, I thought all I got to do is hire an assistant and I should be good to go. I realized there's so much more to it that there's actually almost like four different conversations. The first conversation is getting an assistant. It's a different conversation to how do I get a great assistant? Someone who's really talented, can be a trusted right-hand person, the second half of my brain, my mini-me, who can help me really focus on the high-level tasks. 
The third conversation is not only how do I get an assistant and how do I get a great assistant, but how do I make them stay? Because a great assistant is like a great investment. It's compound interest over time. The longer that they get to know you, the more they know how to do, the more that they can anticipate what you need, the more valuable that they become, right? To the point where they're anticipating and make, making things happen for you before you even ask for it, right? And the fourth conversation is not just how do we get an assistant? How do we get a great assistant? How do we get a great assistant that stays? But actually, how do we get a great assistant that stays and is one of the best investments I've ever made? And a huge part of that, yes, is who do we hire? It's also we pick the right task to delegate and how do we manage and lead that assistant on a daily, weekly, monthly basis? So, you know, and there's maybe a little bit of a trick question here, but if I were to ask the question, is it worth delegating a task that you can get done in five minutes? Most people would say, well, no, because it's going to take me 20 minutes to teach it. Why would I bother? What if that task happens, though, five times a day, every single day, right? And now that's 25 minutes a day, five days a week. That's 125 minutes. That's over two hours a week, multiplied by 50 working weeks a year, right? That's 100 hours, right? So all of a sudden, taking 25 minutes to teach that five minute task, is one of the best investments that you can ever make, right? So as entrepreneurs, if we're, if we're picking the wrong tasks, if we're picking a five-minute or even an hour-long task to delegate, yet it only happens once a month, once a quarter, once a year, it's the wrong task to delegate. We're never going to get ahead. We're not trading an hour to get 10 hours back. We're not trading a few dollars in wages to get lots of more money back in terms of new revenue because we're able to focus on marketing, sales, product development, and networking, or whatever it is we need to do. So that's a big gap is in, for a lot of entrepreneurs is just knowing what to delegate first. Yeah, I would say it's funny because I just talked to a friend of mine and they were telling me, I said, well, what I said, they said, I'll, I said something like, I'll email your assistant. And then he said, no, just email me. I don't have that assistant anymore. And I was like, why? What hmm. happened? And he said, well, you know, sales are down a little bit. And I just didn't feel like I had an ROI on her. Like every other position right. kind of, you know, I could justify. And now that sales are down, I really needed to cut someone and I needed to cut my assistant. And I was thinking to myself, the last person I'd be yes. going to be my assistant. So talk about that for just a bit of how someone can feel like, yes, I'm actually getting an ROI on this person. So I agree wholeheartedly with you that your assistant is the most important person. Like, like you, the last person I would ever let go is my assistant because my assistant is not, I almost don't even think of them as like an external person. Like they're the second half of me and I am the most important asset. I am the most important asset to my business. And that's not an egotistical thing to say. It's just knowing my role. In a surgery room, the surgeon is the most important person. If we don't have the surgeon, nothing else can happen, right? It's a lot tougher to replace the surgeon than it is to replace someone like a caretaker or a janitor, right? Or an administrator. Now, I'm not saying those aren't important roles. It's all important. We need to respect all of it. If any one of those pieces is missing, we can't do it. The hardest person to replace, though, is the surgeon. And it takes the longest to become the surgeon, the most training, the most experience, and whatnot. So if, if, and, and I think there's a really, really, really important question here around like, when's the right time to get an assistant? Because, you know, it's possible to get an assistant too early. And every day we're doing discovery calls with entrepreneurs around North America, talking to them about if it's the right time for them to get an assistant or not, and what are the first few tasks they should be handing off. And sometimes what we're discovering is entrepreneurs will be very excited about the idea of getting an assistant. They'll hear all these great stories and all these rock star stories. Like I, I talk about how anytime I go somewhere and I rent a condo, I'll open up the fridge and my groceries are already there before I get there. Like that's, a, that's kind of a rock star moment, if you know what I mean. And people are like, ooh, I want that. The thing is, is if, if I were to wave a magic wand and to give an entrepreneur 10 hours of free time and said, where would you go and find more revenue? If an entrepreneur can't answer that question, it's probably too early to get an assistant or it's just not the right time. Like I know, Chantel, if I were to say to you, if, you know, if I waved a magic wand and gave you 10 extra hours, how would you go make additional money? You'd probably say, oh, well, I'd pick up another piece of property or I would be able to create a new course or I'd host another event or 
and bang, 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 you'd be able to just produce something. And, and so we're asking questions to entrepreneurs in those discovery calls, like questions like, um, do you have more leads coming in than you're able to handle, right? Do you have more, you know, if someone has a marketing agency, it's like, do you have more requests for marketing services than you can currently fulfill on? If someone has an e-commerce business, it's like, do you have a product that you just know that if you could launch it, it would generate significant new profit for you. You just can't get around to it because you're too bogged down in the ops and admin of the first product that you've got or the first few products. So, so if we can't see a path with like, and it doesn't have to be 10 out of 10 clear, but like seven out of 10 clarity and seven out of 10 confidence, that's such an, I think that's a Navy SEALs uh, decision guideline is 70, 70. You don't need hundred percent confidence. You need hundred percent certainty or clarity rather. But if you're 70, 70, then, then go for it. And once you can establish what we call the path to profitability, now it's, you're almost crazy not to get an assistant at that point because it's so obvious. And I know on my path, all I did, and this is super simple, I had a marketing agency at the time myself. And so I just went to my clients and I just said, hey, we're already doing your Google AdWords. I know the performance of your campaigns would go up if we could just create a custom landing page. It'll take only five hours. I'm charging $40 an hour. It's $200. That's all it is. Are you open to the work? And they'd say, well, Tim, you've done a great job with Google AdWords. Sure, sounds good. Let's give it a shot. And so they would give me $200. Now I'll ask you, Chantel, what do you think I did to the $200? Do you think that I went and bought a new pair of shoes or jeans? No, I, I took those $200 and they gave it to my great assistant, right? And at $15 an hour, she was able to work for me for a block of time. Now she gave me back time. Did I go and Netflix on, did, did I go Netflix binge on like Breaking Bad or something? No, I did not. I took that extra time. And I went back to my clients and said, hey, guess what? I've got like 10 extra hours. Um, we're doing your AdWords. We're doing a landing page for you now. How about we create a, a lead magnet for you, you know, or some kind of an opt-in? And they would say, that sounds great. How much is it? I'd say, well, it's, I've, it's 10 hours and it's $40 an hour. It's $400. So guess what? I just multiplied $200 into $400, right? By bouncing it off my assistant and back. So what did I do those $400 or $500? I did not go to Disneyland. I did not fly anywhere. I did not go on vacation. I gave the money to Sarah, my executive assistant at the time, my great assistant. And now that I was giving her $500, she's able to give me like 30 hours of her time. What did I do those 30 hours of time? I went back to my clients, right? And it was just this like pendulum back and forth. And it created what I call a positive profit loop. And as soon as you can trigger that positive profit loop, now it makes all the sense in the world to get that great assistant and make them one of the best investments you've ever made. Awesome. Well, I know that we just finished um, interviewing Michael Hyatt and we were talking about technology. So let's talk about technology for hiring a great assistant. He gave two pieces of technology that he loved. And one of them is Spark Hire, where you can, instead of doing a traditional phone interview, candidates can answer your questions on their own time yes. via video. And you could review them on like two times speed. So you can kind of look, how do they articulate themselves? How do they present on video? And then the other one was Colby.com, which kind of helped him really decide, is this the right person for me? So what for you, have you used those, uh, those two platforms or is there any other technology that you use when you're saying, hey, I got to find the right assistant. What's the technology you use? Yeah, so I think there's a question even behind the question, in a sense. Um, the, and one of the questions is, do you want to do it yourself or do you want to have someone do it for you in terms of getting an assistant? And if an entrepreneur is already north of six figures, like if a person's generating more than $100,000 in profit, I'm sorry, in revenue or more, most likely getting help is going to be way faster than learning how to do it all on your own. So to give you some context, we when we're finding a winning assistant, we'll look at 50 to 100 applicants to come down with, or we'll look at the equivalent of 50 to 100 applicants. And it takes us the equivalent of 50 to 100 hours to come down with three finalists and one winning assistant. And one of the cardinal sins entrepreneurs make is they'll just go on Facebook and they'll just say, hey, who's, who's looking for work, right? And then they commit the other cardinal sin, which is hiring the first person who says, hey, I'm interested in the job, right? And that, like sourcing that way and vetting that way is just has, it's like your odds of success are probably less than one in four. So there's been research released recently that the success rate of hiring hourly workers in America is actually less than 50%. And that's done by professional managers in, you know, in big companies. So us as entrepreneurs who are not 
focus just on hiring. We have to do marketing and sales and even deliver the product. Our success rate is, is worse than 50%. So now to increase your odds, if you wanted to hire someone else, you could hire someone else. If you want to do it on your own, I'll give you a few suggestions. So number one, um, my, my company is actually certified as a Colby uh, organization. Our, yeah, uh, I was certified for a handful of years. I did hundreds of assessments. Um, I designed it into the, the, of how we do our hiring with great assistant and um, our onboarding consultants are certified. So we're literally doing the Colby method for you um, if, if you're to hire us. If not, no problem. I would just still get a Colby done for yourself and for your prospective finalists and then have a Colby consultant interpret those for you. So I agree with Michael 100% on that. Um, I think a great way to dramatically um, cut down the amount of work if you're looking at uh, hundreds of applications or even if it's just dozens of applications is to use something I call the perfect job posting. And so it's when you post your job opportunity, you instruct people to, uh, candidates to apply by sending an email to a custom email address that you set, set up. That email address will be something like jobs at, you know, my company jobs at gmail.com, just get like a free Gmail address, set up the auto vacation reply to reply back saying, if you're shortlisted, then you'll hear from us within 48 hours. If not, uh, you can assume that we've gone a different direction. That, un that alleviates the burden of you having to write back every single person out of professional courtesy. It's just handled for you. Secondly, by having a custom email inbox just for jobs, then um, you're also avoiding the distraction. Um, kid in the candy store effect kicks in when it's like, oh, like if it's coming in your main email inbox, if you're spending any time in your inbox and you're just like, oh my God, who's this person? Like, oh, could they work? Oh, I'm looking at their resume. Oh, this looks super interesting. It's super, super, super distracting. So we want to like kind of time block and it's way easier to time block if all the inflow of resumes and applications just goes to a different email inbox that you're not seeing all the time. Now, so, so when candidates apply, they're going to apply to that custom email address. You're going to have the signature auto reply with a vacation message. And the third thing is when candidates apply, you're going to ask them to apply in a very specific way. You're going to have them write you an email and the subject line is going to say, hi, my name is, insert their name, from their city. Interested in name of the position. So executive assistant or personal assistant or whatever it is you're looking for help with. Now, from there, you're going to get all these applications that come in, especially if you're posting on something like Elance or on Craigslist or something like that. If, if a candidate can't get the sub line right, don't even, don't even click on the email. Like this is their foot forward. If this is the level of hunger that they have for the position and the attention to detail that they've got or don't have and their ability to follow instructions or not, if they can't get the subject line right, don't even open the email. Just let them receive that auto reply and never write back to them. And that's that. Now, that on its own will eliminate dozens of candidates who just are not the right fit for you, right? So then from there, for those who did get the subject line right, you're going to click and open. And in the instructions, you're going to tell them to write you a, a five paragraph email, specifically an opening salutation of hello with your name three paragraphs explaining why they'd be great at the job and a closing salutation and to not include a resume. Now, if by saying not include a resume, guess what? If you're looking at all the emails that come in, if there's that little paperclip icon that they've attached to resume, they didn't follow the instructions, don't even open the email. So if they did follow the instructions, now you're reading the email, you want to tell them that in the body of the email, you want the first paragraph to be black, 12 point times New Roman, second paragraph to be red, Verdana, um, Courier, third paragraph, Arial, Blue, 16 point. And so you don't even have to read the content. You can just look, is it red, blue, and black? If it's not red, blue, and black in different fonts, they didn't follow the instructions, just delete them. So by having people jump through these hoops in the very beginning, it's actually a work test. They don't realize it, but it's actually a work test from the very first moment they're meeting you. I think that that has been the single biggest time saver that I ever discovered when I was doing it myself. Now, the biggest time saver of all is to have a professional agency do it for you if they're a good agency. But if you're going to do it on your own, that's a great tip, more so than any tech that I ever found along the way. I love the analogy that you give about kind of like thinking about 
a CEO as the surgeon and how a surgeon needs to do surgeon tasks and not do things that are non-surgeon tasks. Expand on that for us. Yeah, I was thinking a lot about this. Um, I Hopefully this doesn't make this sound weird, but I get all my best ideas in the shower. Um, hashtag shower thoughts. And um, I was standing in the shower one day and I was like, what is it about workflow? I mean, these are the things I think about. I'm super nerdy about, about all this. So, and it, it dawned on me that a really great analogy is a surgeon in the room. And if you think about it, the surgeon doesn't prepare the room. The surgeon doesn't uh, do a lot of the paperwork. A surgeon doesn't handle the finance if it's in the United States and health insurance. Um, a surgeon does not deal with getting blood or tools from down the hallway in the supply closet. Like they, they don't book the nurses. They don't do any of that, right? The surgeon shows up in the room, performs a surgery and leaves. Now there's a little bit before the surgery, right? They'll meet with the patient and they'll talk about what's going on. What's the issue? What's the surgical procedure they're going to do? And, and that surgeon may also be talking to other surgeons to say, hey, I'm dealing with this particular situation. What's your advice? So if you back up and you really were to categorize all that, there's really only three things a surgeon does. And these are the exact same three things that an entrepreneur needs to be focused on. The first is strategy. The second is high-level skill. And the third is high-level access. So in terms of strategy, that surgeon is saying, what procedure are we going to use, right? In terms of high-level skill, that surgeon is performing the surgery. In terms of high-level access, that surgeon is talking to other surgeons. Like, I don't think a janitor would be able to just text a surgeon and just say, hey, like, how you doing? What do you think? There's just, there's that access gap, right? And secondly, that surgeon also has access to their own medical license that they're able to sign off on certain final documents that no one else in the room can. So for entrepreneurs, high-level access might be signing authority, might be access to our bank accounts, might be legal agreements, right? Um, and also networking. My goodness, is networking ever huge for, for, for most entrepreneurs, right? So something that I do is I host dinner parties. So I've hosted uh, over 40 dinner parties now uh, at my home here in Austin in just the last few years. And my job is to come up with a strategy of like, you know, who are we going to hire to clean my apartment and make sure that all the, the prep is done properly and the place looks gorgeous. It was my job to hire the interior designer to say what napkins are going to use, which wine glasses and making sure that all looks good. My high level access is buying everything, having access to the capital. And also like I have the lease to this apartment. So I signed off on it and I got the apartment, right? Um, and then in terms of high level access, my job once a dinner party is going is to just be a great host, to shake everyone's hand, to memorize everyone's bios, to introduce them to each other, follow up with people afterwards. That's it. It's not my job to coordinate with the restaurant that caters all our food, to, to coordinate with all the staff. It's not my job to make sure that allergies and different food diets are respected. It's not my job to make sure that we have all the supplies all the time. I may pay for it, but it's not my job. Now, now I, I'm probably painting a picture that's like very luxurious and maybe that's like out of reach for a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, but I'll tell you that even when I was making $39,000 a year, it was the exact same approach. If I'm going to be doing a marketing project, it's my job to meet with my client to come up with the strategy for their marketing campaign. It's my job to do the high level skill, like selling to them, negotiating, and maybe writing copy. If that's part of what I'm doing is writing the website copy. It's not my job though, to coordinate an invoice, you know, to manage that, to do tech support, customer support, to run errands, right? To do any of that. And so, you know, Dan Kennedy was famous for saying, if you ever saw one of his salespeople mowing his lawn, he'd throw a fit because any kid across the street could mow that lawn for like 20 bucks. And here a salesperson is missing out on making sales calls because they're mowing the lawn. Now, if someone loves mowing the lawn and that's their way to just really zen out and relax, then more power to them. For most people, if I said, okay, well then what's the best way to relax? They'd say, I'm going to go to the spa. Good point. Let's go to the spa to relax. Let's delegate mowing the lawn to someone else. So I just really think, you know, and it's not something you can just turn on, turn off where it's like, well, I'm the surgeon and let the balls fall where they may, let the chips fall where they may. It's a, it's a shades of gray process, right? Where you're going to work yourself out of being all the other roles. At the end of the day, use the entrepreneur. I need you focused on just strategy, high level skill, high level access, and delegate everything else. And now a word from our sponsor, Canzel Realty. Run your business your way, only at Canzel Realty. You can have all of the freedom with none of the standard real estate red tape. 
As an agent at Canzel, you'll have the ability to be on a 100% split with no yearly or monthly tech fees. You'll get access to revenue share and stock award options, top tier leads program options, access to a local broker in every major city instead of just one for the whole state, a local circle leader to help you and your business, access to incredible national speakers and training, an unmatched suite of free technology. At Canzo, you get the best of both worlds. All the technology, revenue sharing, and equity awards of a national firm combined with the close-knit feel and support of a local firm. Build your real estate business your way, only at Canzel Realty. So what would you say to someone? Let's say that someone listening, maybe they have a virtual assistant. Maybe they're paying $4 an hour in the Philippines, and they mm. have an assistant that's just not moving the needle. They're kind of one of these people who, if you tell them to put the circle in the circle hole, they're going to do that. But beyond that, they're mm. not you know, being proactive and things like that. And they're debating whether or not they should kind of spend more, find someone in the U.S. that's going to help them move the needle. How would you convince them? Um, well, if they haven't convinced themselves that they don't have a problem, then then there's no problem. You know what I mean? Um, uh, another one of my favorite shower thoughts, I was standing in the shower and it dawned on me that knowing how to swing a tool is skill, knowing which tool to pick up in the first place is wisdom. And I think that there's a really fantastic place for overseas assistance for a few dollars an hour. Um, and I would say that specifically for tasks that are repeating, that don't have a lot of different decision-making, don't have a lot of customer interaction, um, like particularly if we're talking about like $4 an hour, obviously there's a lot of talented overseas talent, you know, that are paid at higher rates um, that would have higher skill sets. If we're really just talking about $4 an hour, you know, uh, lower skill, you know, earlier in their career or whatnot, um, I would pick tasks that happen that repeat, you know, that are, don't require a lot of decisions. It's just very much follow this step by step, or if this, then that, and it's extremely clear, there's not a lot of decision making. And part of that is that there's actually a lot of cultural nuance, like a ton of cultural nuance. Like um, I was in I was in Mexico City not too long ago, and like I was in someone else's country and I was operating in someone else's culture. So for me to to try and be really effective, it just wouldn't work, right? So it's about being effective. Who has just that native level knowledge of your culture, native level knowledge of your language, and is in a close enough time zone that if something goes wrong, you can pick up the phone, have a conversation and be able to work with each other. So the other way that I would say working overseas makes sense is if you have non-critical, non-time specific projects and tasks as well. So oftentimes that ends up being like data entry. Oftentimes that ends up being tasks like repeating the exact same upload or creating the same landing pages over and over and over again. Okay, That's a great tool for that job. Yeah, so let's talk about the full-time employee versus a virtual assistant and how does someone decide? So do you help people find people who are maybe just part-time? Like if someone says, look, right now, I only need somebody 20 hours a week. I'm not quite ready to kind of jump in all the way mm -hmm. to 40 hours. Do you help them find a 20 hour a week? And do you only find virtual assistants, meaning they're going to be located somewhere else? I live in Virginia Beach. If I said to you, okay, I I want a, somebody in my office full-time in Virginia Beach. Do you help with that as well? So we only hire assistants based in the United States or Canada. We only work with entrepreneurs based in the United States or Canada. And we only work in virtual working relationships. And here's, here's one of the reasons why. Is uh, we did research and we found that it was 97% of Americans wish they could work from home at least part-time while still commuting into work a few days a week. And it was like 64 or 67% of Americans wish they could work from home full time. It's not 64 or 67% of the jobs available in the United States that allows people to work from home full time. So, and full time doesn't necessarily mean 40 hours a week. That could be 30 hours a week, but like their whole job is from home. The crush of demand for work from home is incredible. And for probably the next five years at least, us as entrepreneurs, we can take advantage of that. Big companies are too big and too slow. They're like a slow battleship turning the corner. They can't take advantage of work from home the way that we can. And so, it, so that's the first thing is there's this huge demand. Secondly, the second reason we, we do virtual is that 
the, the pool of talent available to you if you're only hiring in Virginia Beach might be 100,000 people. If you'd say, you know, a 20 minute drive from your office in any direction, we might be talking about 100,000 people. Whereas if we say we're going to hire anyone in the United States or Canada, we're talking about 350 million people, 360 million people. It's a huge catchment area. And especially if you're living in a higher income area, like 20 bucks an hour in Manhattan or San Francisco or downtown LA, you're not going to attract the, the best talent, like with a ton of experience and credentials. Whereas if someone in New York or LA or even Austin for that matter, if I'm willing to say, yeah, I'll work with someone from Topeka, Kansas, or I'll work with someone from Springfield, Missouri, right? You might get someone who has like an MBA, or you might get someone who has like 20 years experience thrilled to work in your organization for like $23 an hour. So the caliber of talent you get is just extraordinary. Um, my grandfather, um, I'm the first generation off the farm. So my grandfather is a farmer. And he said, Tim, good, fast, cheap. You can only ever get two of the three. And I thought about it and I was like, that's true. If I, if I were to get in a little car wreck or car accident and I had a fender bender, I needed to get it fixed. Um, I could get it fixed good and fast, but it ain't going to come cheap good and cheap, I'd have to ask my grandpa for help and he'd do it on the evenings and weekends. It wouldn't come very fast. If I wanted a fast and cheap, I'd have to go to the only place in town that has no business because they're no good, right? So another one of my shower thoughts was, I was thinking about this and talent, compensation, and conditions, pick two of the three. Mm. Talent, compensation, conditions. If you're going to say to someone, I want you to be skilled and experienced, which I highly recommend that you do look for that in your assistant, seeing as they're going to be the second half of your brain and your mini me who's going to help you make uh, right, really run all parts of, of your business in your life. Um, so if we got high skill and, and then from there, if we say work conditions, they have to be in my office, nine to five, Monday to Friday on location. Guess what? You've just described a traditional nine to five. And now you as an employer, you're competing against Coca-Cola, IBM, Google, you know, all the insurance companies, government jobs, you're competing in the main market, which sucks. You're going to have to, so guess what? If you're going to demand high talent and you're going to demand your conditions, you're going to have to pony up the cash, which is not going to be 22 bucks an hour, right? On the flip side, if you say, hey, I'm going to be flexible on the conditions, you can work from home. You can work maybe two thirds time or half time or something like that. I'm good if you work some non-traditional hours, like maybe if you want to be with your kids in the morning and afternoon, you can make up the hours in the evening, right? If you're willing to be flexible in those conditions, you'll get amazing talent for $18 to $22 an hour. So let's talk about your virtual assistant. Like, does she live in Austin, Texas? What are her hours? Uh, just give us a little bit of example of what you do with her because you do have different things going on at night, parties at night, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How does her hours work? And talk about time zones. So if someone, for example, if I live in Virginia Beach and you hired someone for me in California, that might be annoying to me because I'd be like, okay, it's nine o'clock. Oh, I can't get a hold of her because it's 6 a.m. She's not awake yet. Mm. Yeah. So great. Love all those questions. So, uh, so my great assistant, her name is Denise. Uh, she lives in San Diego which is Pacific LA time. And I'm in Austin, which is central time, which is Chicago, Chicago time zone. Right. Um, so I really think of, so I, th I think a lot of people, when they think of an assistant, they think of a secretary, like they think of someone who's like in their office and is answering the phones per se. I think of an assistant as the second half of me. Right. And so the fact that my assistant isn't in town doesn't really matter. Like, Yes, I still need mail opened and my assistant is able to go on thumbtack.com or cure.com and find someone who is local, who's going to be a little more expensive because they're local and that person can work maybe five hours a week or 10 hours a month or something like that to do just the few things that are required that are actually required locally. Like it's interesting if you think about boardroom meetings, how often do people make a decision and say, oh, I'll go back to my office and I'll email you. So even people who work in an office setting are still working virtually with each other, which is so interesting. And so I think of my assistant as the quarterback of like Tim Inc. She runs my business. She runs my social life. She even interacts sometimes with my family. 
And anytime I need a flight to go home to Canada, which I just, you know, I, I have a brand new nephew. So in a couple of weekends, I'm flying up to Canada. My assistant takes care of making sure that I've got the flights, I've got the accommodations and making sure that our team members know that I'm going to be away. And also, and it, with the permission of my family, my assistant even communicates with my family about like grocery list items and like different plans and whatnot. And because I've talked to my family about it, they're all cool with it. Now, if your family's not cool with it, that's fine. Just don't have your assistant do that part of it. I just think that by having my assistant be my quarterback, she's coordinating all the other experts and talent in my world, including my team members, also including my dentist, my hairdresser, right? She's taking care of also like our vendor, the food vendor who caters food for us, for our dinner parties, live events, all of it. She is the second half of me. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs think, well, should I hire a salesperson first or should I hire an administrator first? No, 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 no. That's stage two. Stage one is duplicating yourself. And that's where the great assistant comes in. That's the first person to hire is someone who becomes the second half of you. Now we can start getting into like different tactics or functional units like sales or marketing or something else. You're the, you're the number one asset and we need to maximize your capacity before we start bringing on other people to do other capacities. So as companies become more virtual, there's a lot of people out there saying, okay, well, if you want to make remote work more effective, you have to have key goals for that person to do. And really at the end of the day, let's pretend like you had a salesperson that was virtual and you said, okay, you need to set 10 appointments this month, right? And it's like, who cares if they work from home or where, wherever they work, at the end of the day, it's a very specific goal that they have to reach. You've got to set 10 appointments and two sales or whatever. Well, when it comes to a virtual assistant, they're, you know, you're throwing balls all the time, right? So it's like this ball, that ball, that ball, this changes, this changes. So it's harder to make a specific goal where they have to hit. Like mm -hmm. at the end of the month, here's your, your metrics, the key metrics for that position, I would say every position in our company, they have very specific goals that they have to hit every single month. Mm -hmm. For managing partners, they have to hire four new people every single month. They have a minimum goal and a maximum goal. And it's very specific. Right. For an assistant though, I have a few things that she has to do each month, but then there's a lot of wiggle room because we have different balls throwing in. So how do you, because they're virtual, make sure that they are working and they're not just at target all day and doing this and they're you're holding them accountability. How how is the accountability factor working for that virtual assistant? Yeah, so a few things. Number 1, my whole team is virtual. We've got eight people. Everyone is remote. I have a salesperson. So everything you described, I've I've done it all. Like that that you've described. So every role, every functional unit, so if you want to call it sales or production like has outcomes they have to hit. I would say the one person on the team who does not have a firm outcome that they have to hit is my EA. Because I'll say the same thing tonight. Say it's the one, yeah, it's the one exception, right? Because most of the other people on our team are more, let's say, proactive in nature of what they're doing. Like my sales guy can pick up the phone and and call customers to see if they want a second assistant or follow up with people who said follow up with me in six months or whatever. Um, my, my executive assistant though, she is very much in a reactive role, right? Where I'm throwing things at her all the time. I'm like, can you connect this person to that person? Pull that file, get me ready for this meeting, right? Oh, change of, you know, this interview changed time of day. Can you move it around? Like, can you get the food delivered for me at this different time? Like, and so because of that, it's, and I've tried, I've tried before having like a scorecard for my assistant, like I have for everyone else on my team. And it was just weird. It was like, uh, we're going to measure how many mistakes you make in a day or how many emails you answer. Like, no, no, I no, no. I did the same thing. It didn't work. It's all a mess, right? Exactly. So, so for me, I think that, and this is one of my aha moments when I, when I had that three months of being sick, I couldn't walk. I had so much time to think. It was really a gift. It was an amazing, amazing gift. And in that, in that kind of like meditative state, I realized that, it's not like, so, so consider that your assistant, they are an expense. There's just no, there's no other way to just, you know, to get around it. They are an expense. And if all you thought about is, 
is my assistant a revenue generator? The answer is absolutely no, because they're not selling for you. <laughs> they're not marketing. They're not negotiating. They're not helping you make money like in, in, in of themselves. On the other hand, if we redefine it slightly, and I think this is the more accurate way to define it is my relationship with my assistant. Not just is my assistant a profit center. The question is, is my relationship with my assistant a profit center? So the difference there for me is my assistant is going to send invoices and handle my calendar and deal with emails coming in. Not much about that is profitable for us, right? Now, on the other hand, if my assistant is taking those things off my plate and I get to now go and generate sales, speak on a stage, lead the team, do training, attend a high-level mastermind, or, or spend time with a mentor, right? Where I'm learning how to grow my business. Well, now if you package us together, my relationship with my assistant is one of the most powerful profit centers in the whole company because I can put into the relationship 10 hours and get 100 hours back. I can put in $100 and get $1,000 back from the relationship and the net effect of the whole relationship. That's how you need to think about it. And that is, that is why a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck is they say, well, I don't really want to hire, like I'll hire a salesperson because they drive revenue. Well, think about it. If you were to hire an hour, a salesperson, how much would you have to pay them, right? You would have to pay them yeah, at least probably $50,000 a year, if not more, plus commission, right? Like a good salesperson is probably pulling from seventy-five dollars to $200,000 a year easy. If it's, a, you know, if it's a good product and they're really good at what they do, right? They're familiar with the industry and all the rest. Do you want to do you want to take the sales work off your plate so you, and then pay someone seventy five thousand to two hundred thousand dollars a year, or would you rather take the admin stuff off your plate for eighteen to twenty two bucks an hour and you just keep doing the sales stuff? Right, you're going to make and keep way more money if you get the non surgery stuff off your plate first before you start trying to delegate strategy, high level skill, or high level access. You'll make way more money. You'll keep way more money. There's a right sequence about going about it, and and finding your mini me is the place to start. Last thing, I recorded with Tan of Asian Efficiency yesterday. And one of the things he said that I thought was a gem is that he said when he gives his assistant something, he has 24 hours. So what he says to her is when I give you something, my expectation is for it to be done in 24 hours. So if I gave it to you at one o'clock, by one o'clock tomorrow, I'm, I'm already assuming you've done it. If you haven't done it, come back to me and say, I know you gave this to me 24 hours ago, but I wasn't able to accomplish this because of A, B, and C. Do you have any nuggets or systems in place like that for your assistant that puts timelines on getting things done? Because sometimes that can be a big frustration is, you know, I gave you A, B, C, and D to do, and you didn't complete it. Right. So, so in addition to getting a great assistant and in addition to knowing what to delegate first, how we delegate to them makes a massive difference and how we're also kind of following up with them, right? So, so two things. Number one, this is probably the most popular tool I've ever invented. It's bookmarked on more browsers around the world than I even know, like, like thousands of browsers have bookmarked this single tool that I offer and it's free. It's called 360 Delegation. And when we delegate something, whether it's to an assistant or to any other team member, when we're clear about the vision, the resources, and the definition of done, it is amazing how much a teammate can get things done without having to boomerang back to us to ask for help or to boomerang back with work that they think is done right, but it's actually done incorrectly. Inside of the vision, you're going to share, here's the milestones of when things should be completed by. And so that single tool, I highly recommend everyone grab that tool and get clarity. A second tool that's really helpful is a daily report. And so for the entire, I think the first two years that my executive assistant worked for me, my first great assistant, um, at the end of every day that she worked for me, so I mean, not on days off, but just on days that she worked uh, with me and for me, I'd have her write me a report and it was on her to email me, not the other way around. I'm not chasing after my assistant. My assistant is emailing into me and she would answer a few questions. It would be, what did you do today? Where did you get stuck? How can I help you? What are you doing tomorrow? And by getting an assistant unstuck in under 24 hours, instead of like waiting six and a half days until your next weekly meeting, that can just 
save a world of frustration for you and for your assistant. Because at the end of the day, your assistant wants to do a great job for you. They want to impress you. You are the boss. And whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, as soon as you have any teammates, as soon as you move from just yourself in the business to one teammate, you just became a coach. You just became a coach. And what does a good coach do? A good coach will demonstrate, this is how I want it done. This is what success looks like. This is how we play the game. And then review and then sit back and say, okay, now your turn, right? I'm going to watch you do it. And I'm going to give you some feedback. And then once you're good enough, then you can go and do it independently. And we, so we got to have, we got to complete that loop, right? So we got to be clear on 360 delegation. You need those daily reports, especially in the first, I would say bare minimum six months, probably longer. And thirdly is absolutely have a weekly meeting with your assistant. I, the, the better your assistant gets and the more you're good at your work, in my experience, the more you're going to want to meet with your assistant. So I actually have an, I have a 90 minute meeting with my assistant every uh, Monday. And then from there, uh, two or three days in a week, we have half an hour meetings in the morning just to catch up because I want to get, I want to get all the bottlenecks smashed and out of the way. So she can just keep trucking, 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 which really frees me up to do things like this, like be with you here today. Awesome. Well, I will tell you, there's a show. There was a show on E! Reality TV. It was a series called The Girls Next Door. And it was a mm. life of a, the Playboy Mansion. It was a girl named right. Kendra Wilkinson Basket. And she's known for being one of Hugh Hefner's girlfriends. And she has this scene. I have to find it for you. I've got to figure out where it is. So she has an assistant. And this is what she says to her. And I, I have said this story to all my assistants when they first start. And she goes, I keep reminding you about this stuff. She's like, I feel like you, I'm your assistant. You're supposed to be my assistant <laughs> and I'm reminding you about all this stuff. And so I always start when we have a new assistant. I have a great assistant now. I, so I haven't told that story in a really long time. I just thought about it, but it's true, right? So it's like, one of the things I do is I have them, I, I tell people, I say, I've got a hundred things thinking in my head. So once you've told me I've completed this or completed this or completed this, I'm not wondering anymore. So that daily right. report, I now know that's taken care of, that's taken care of. And all these different bubbles of things that we as entrepreneurs have in our head, I don't have to ask you. If I ever have to ask you, was this completed? Then you didn't do your job, right? Because I'm not your assistant, you're my assistant. So yeah. this has been amazing. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Yeah, you bet. So if you like, including some of the free tools I talked about, like 360 delegation and the perfect job posting, head over to greatassistant.com forward slash Chantel Ray. And on that page, you'll see a few different things. Uh, one of the buttons you can click gives you the opportunity to download 360 delegation, the tool. Um, also, uh, other tools that are related to getting, keeping, managing, and making profitable your great assistant. Uh, whether you ever hire an assistant from us or not, these tools are super, super helpful. Um, there's also a button on there. It's an orange button, and that gives you an opportunity to book a discovery call. If you wanted to book a session with our client advisor, he will have a conversation with you. And what he's listening for is three things. Number one is, uh, what's your path to profitability? And he'll help you figure one out. If you don't have one, that's okay. He can talk to you to see if you got one or not. Uh, he can also hear about fit about if our program would be a fit or not. And also timing. Is it too early to get an assistant? Or should you have gotten an assistant six months ago kind of thing? And if for any reason you you don't fit within those three elements, fit timing and profitability, um, our client advisor can also make recommendations of other programs or other steps to take, or maybe a timeline like to circle back with us in six months, or maybe don't circle back with us at all because it's just not a fit or something like that. So uh, he's really fantastic listening. And, and I, I talk to a lot of our customers after they become customers. And they always say he's just like such a kind person, so warm, never any pressure, and they're just an amazing resource. So greatassistant.com forward slash Chantel Ray. And of course, everyone knows that Chantel is with an E and Ray is with an A. So that we get Chantel Ray spelled properly. That'll get you over to the, the free resources. Well, thank you so much. And you guys stay tuned because we have another episode coming up in just a minute. So stay with us. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 